All right, so that's what I've done. So what are my tools? Well, I'm a chemist, right? So in each of those cases, I've been working with someone who is a biologist, right? I needed a biologist to come along and say, hey, let's look at this beetle because it's got these cool hairs that have droplets on them. What's in those droplets, right? I wouldn't have known that. I'm a chemist, right? And so what do I bring to the table in this collaboration? Well, I bring my ability to use these two instruments, right? And those instruments tell you two things. So this is an NMR, it's short for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, right? Uh, it's very similar to an MRI machine, if you have to go get an MRI because you've hit your head too hard or something. Uh, it's very similar to that, but much, much finer detail you're looking at each individual molecule level. Um, and it helps me figure out uh, what types of molecules are in something. So this gives you an idea of the types of molecules that are in something. This instrument, what it's really good at, is telling you how much each molecule weighs. And so what you can do when you know both these things, the MS, sorry, uh, it stands for liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry, okay? And what that's really saying is that we're gonna separate out your molecules and tell you what each individual one weighs. And when you can combine the weight of it with sort of what kind it is or what the chemical environment of each, each atom is, right, then you can figure out the structures. So that's what I'm an expert at. I want to apply these things to chemical ecology. Okay, and so what am I doing now? I'm doing insect chemical ecology. And why am I doing insect chemical ecology? Because insects are awesome, right? Insects are really, really cool. They are incredibly diverse, right? There's a, a famous quote out there by a, by a biologist uh, whose last name is Haldane. Uh, he's long since passed. Anyway, the quote was uh, apparently, it's a story, that he was talking to a series of theologians, right, of, of uh, uh, Christian teachers, and they said, what is your studies of biology? What, what have they told you about the Creator? And this biologist said that he has an inordinate fondness of beetles, right? And so the, the story here is that there's just so, so, so many bugs out there, so many beetles out there, right? There's a huge diversity, lots of things to study. The, the next thing that's really good about studying insects is they're typically at a scale where they are macroscopic, right? We can see them. Right? We can see and interact with individuals. But at the same time, they do most of their battling on the chemical level. Right? So if I was to look at, let's say, this beetle, I wouldn't be as excited about that one chemically because it's got this big shell and big horn to fight things. Right? But if you look at the one at the top with the red, red with black dots, Right? Now that's a beetle that looks like it's chemically protected. Right? That's one that said, hey, don't eat me. Right? I'm really obvious, here I am. And so that's the kind of thing I want to look at. Right? And there's so, so many of these stories. And the stories can get really complex. Right? So we can say, oh, there's an insect and it's got a chemical defense. But where does it get that chemical defense from? Does it make it itself? Does it eat something that has it? Then we can say, what if something eats it? Does the thing that eat it have that chemical defense now? So on and so forth. So you can get these expanding webs of interesting, interesting interactions. And so I really like that. Um, but to be honest, there are many types of organisms that can do that. I particularly pick insects. Okay, so my little niche right now, what I've published a few papers on, and I've got at least two more I have to get out. I was supposed to write that while I was here. Have not done a good job of doing that. I've been loving Hong Kong too much. All right, so what I've been working on is fireflies, okay? Um, there are several species of fireflies in Hong Kong. None of these are them, right? These are all North American fireflies uh, from the northeast of the U.S., sort of near where I am in New York, New England area, okay? And a long time ago, like in the late 1970s, people found out that Fireflies are actually toxic. They have molecules sort of like this one, right? Which, if you uh, have a keen eye for chemicals, you'll say is pretty similar to the ones we saw in the monarch butterflies over there. Slightly different up here, right? But pretty similar. Anyway, 
So um, fire, some fireflies were found to have them, but people studied about three different species of fireflies out of the, the hundreds and said, okay, we're done, let's move on, right? And uh, my biology collaborator, uh, who also works at a liberal arts college, said, wait, 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 not so fast, let's take a look at some of the other ones. And so that's, that's what I've spent about four or five years doing now. So the first of the stories here is gonna be about the winter firefly. What's really cool about the winter firefly is that it's active in the winter. Right? And so most insects don't like the Northeast US winter. They have to hide in either like a larval stage or an egg stage and uh, wait until it's warm enough to get out and move around. But these ones are active during the winter. And then the other thing that's interesting about them is that most fireflies, both here and in the US, are called that because they shine a light. Right? They have this cool bioluminescence Right, they have these lantern organs that they shine a light. Okay, these guys don't do that, so they don't have in the adult stage. They do in the lower stage, but as an adult, they do not have a light organ. Okay, and so they were different enough that my biology collaborator was like, you know, what's up with these guys? Do you think they're still toxic? Because you know, maybe they don't shine a light because shining a light gets them eaten because they're not toxic. So we wanted to figure out if they're toxic or not. The other question we had is uh, something to do with their relationships to other fireflies. So this is what's called a phylogenetic tree. You don't have to worry about it too much. Essentially, if two species are closer here, it means they're closer related. And at the time we started our project, there were two competing, this is actually from a paper, I just did the red circles. There were two competing hypotheses. A molecular analysis said that these ones, the winter fireflies, that's number nine up there, are really closely related to the chemically protected ones, number 10. Okay. And another, another paper based on the, the structural features of the insects said, no, 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 they're very, very different. Right? They're not at all closely related. So we thought, well, if they have similar, similar chemicals, it would lend some additional evidence to the molecular analysis. Okay, so what do you need if you want to just uh, figure out the chemistry of of an insect, you need lots of the insect, right? So uh, my collaborator got me 500 beetles, right? So 500 of these, which is down a lot from the 50,000 I needed at the other time, so it's, it's progress, okay? Uh, we then took them and we put them on a freeze dryer. I don't know if they have astronaut ice cream here, but in, the, in Florida, where I grew up, right, they sell this stuff called astronaut ice cream. They take ice cream and they freeze dry it, and then it's sort of like cotton candy. Anyway, so we freeze dried them, ground them up in a mortar and pestle, right? And then chemically extracted them, right? Got all the good stuff out of there. And then I used the NMR that I talked about to figure out what the compounds were, used the mass spectrometry to see how much those compounds weigh, help me figure out what they are. And then we found that they also have this type of compound, right? So this type of compound. Um, was known from earlier firefly work, like I said, from the, the uh, late 1970s. This class of compound is called a uh, lucibufagin, right? I'll use that term later, so I just wanted to say it now. Lucibufagin, uh, also abbreviated LBG, okay? And so these lucibufagins also affect the heart, right? Just like the ones from what we do. And so that's why you shouldn't eat many fireflies if you're in the US. Okay. Uh, this compound I like to show because as a chemist, what I wanted to do is find some new, something new to science altogether, right? And that's what this is. We found a series of four compounds that were completely new chemical structures that no one had ever seen before. And at a liberal arts institution, me and my collaborator, we were able to figure out a completely new compound and publish it. So I was super, super excited about that. Okay. So then the next question is, okay, if these things are toxic, right, then why are they dark, right? Why don't they light up anymore? Why are they hiding in the winter when there's not many insects around, right? And the answer we were thinking might be the fact that there are these predatory fireflies. So it turns out that there's some big fireflies that eat the smaller fireflies that have the toxins. And when they do so, they take 
the, the chemicals and use it for themselves, right? They sequester them, right? But the winter fireflies aren't active whenever these guys are around. So we need some way of testing whether this is even a reasonable hypothesis. Is, it, is the hypothesis that these fireflies evolved to come out at a different time of year and to not light up because they were being eaten by these fireflies which do a really cool thing, which is called aggressive mimicry. They will flash a signal back at a flashing firefly, and when the male firefly comes over uh, to, to mate with the flash, instead it gets eaten up, grabbed and eaten, right? And all its, all its uh, chemicals are stolen to protect the, the predatory firefly. So we were saying, well now, there's some selective pressure here. There's some rationale for why these things might not light up because maybe when they got when they were lighting up, the, the pressure, selective pressure that they were getting eaten made them run away. Right? And run away to when it's cold and when they don't flash. So in our experiment, we had to artificially bring the two back together. And that's what my biology collaborator did. He actually raised some of these guys up in the lab so that uh, they would be out and around in the winter time when we had some of the other ones and then we fed them we fed the raised ones some uh, firefly or some of the the winter firefly and then we took each individual and we ran it on the nmr now i know not being chemists that may not seem so exciting but as a as a chemist, it was really exciting that we could take a single insect. Remember I said, when we started with the beetles in my postdoc, I used 50,000. And then when we found the new compounds from the winter firefly, I used 500. Now I'm using one, right? And so this is, this is getting really exciting. Uh, unfortunately, the peaks we care about are way down here. <laughs> These little blips you probably can't see. What you can see here, right, all those were actually Right? So uh, bugs are fat, just like some seminar presenters. But if you look past the fat, you'll see something really interesting, right? And that's at these peaks, which correspond to that compound that I told you about, the lucibufagens, are actually there. And in the top trace, what's called, uh, what I have labeled A here, that's uh, one of these uh, predatory fireflies that did not eat a winter firefly. The bottom trace, like would B, there's uh, one that did eat a, uh, a predatory firefly, that did eat a winter firefly, and every single one that ate a winter firefly had these compounds in it. But we saw a weird situation when we used a control species, a uh, control beetle that didn't have these compounds in it. Surprisingly, three of our predatory fireflies still ended up with the, the compounds, and we were really Concerned, we thought that this showed some error in our experimental process, right? How are they getting them? We know these beetles don't have them. So we needed to try something else, okay? And so, what is less than a single firefly, a single bug, a blood test from the bug? Okay? And so what we, what we were able to do is my collaborator would annoy these beetles enough to where they would put out a little drop of hemolymph blood, or bug blood, right? They'd put out a little bug blood. And then he'd take a little capillary tube and touch it there, okay? And then put that aside. Then he would feed them a winter firefly, make it bleed again, test it with a new capillary tube, and then we could pair the two samples so that we knew which individual we were looking at and whether it had them or not. So, when we, uh, when we look at something like this, what we're looking at is something, uh, I say, I only want to see the molecules that weigh what these lucibufagens weigh, right? And so when we have a standard of it, we see a big peak right around three minutes. We looked, didn't have it before it fed. After we fed it, big peak right there. Right? So we were able to say that this individual didn't have any to start with, but it did after the uh, uh a winter firefly. So when we fed it a, a control thing, I didn't have the peak still. So that way we were able to track whether each individual uh, predatory firefly was uh, able to take these things. So 
what did this tell us? What did we learn from this? Well, we learned that if you have a monster that eats you when you light up, right, you're likely to switch off that light, right? And so that's, that was the, the story that we learned from, from, from that experiment. All right, so uh, our next thing, we took a new species of firefly, also hadn't been studying for these chemicals before, and uh, we wanted to see if they had them. And after our set of experiments, uh, they did, right? So that's, that's nice, right? But what was really interesting about these ones is that uh, whereas with the predatory ones, they didn't make them themselves, they had to take them. These ones made them, right? And my collaborator could ra raise them in the lab. And what that gave us access to was, can we see whether these are somehow making these compounds from scratch themselves, or are they actually secretly taking it from some food source? And, and so we set up a pretty cool experiment where uh, my biology collaborator, he had some of the larva, he was feeding it snails, right? he fed them snails, and he took some cholesterol, okay? Either normal cholesterol or cholesterol that has been labeled with an isotope of carbon-13. So if uh, most carbon out there, 99% of all carbon out there weighs 12 mass units, okay? But we bought some cholesterol where two of those carbons, instead of weighing 12, weigh 13 mass units. Okay. And so we can actually track whether these labeled cholesterol were turned into the lucibufagens by checking the weight. Right? Remember I said we can weigh, the weigh a molecule on the mass spectrometer. Well, if it weighs two more than we expect it to weigh, then that means that two of the carbon 12s have been changed out for carbon 13s. And so we actually did this experiment, and what we were able to see is in ones that were, um, in ones that were fed the labeled cholesterol, right, they had a much higher proportion of this molecule that weighs two more than we would expect, right? M plus is what we would expect, so M plus plus two is two more than what we would expect, right? So they had a lot more of this two, two more than what we would expect weight, right? If they were fed that cholesterol, but not uh, just one more, right? So it really was the cholesterol that we were feeding them that was getting turned into these compounds, the lucibufagens. So we did this for two different lucibufagens. So that was really cool too, because what that told us is that these fireflies can build the molecules. And we like that, right? So again, we're answering a new chemical question that, that we were interested in. And then the last one, chemical question that we had uh, was, it turns out there's a parasitic fly that feeds on the winter fireflies, and uh, it'll lay its eggs in the winter fireflies, these little grubs come out, and they crawl around, and then they pupate, right, and turn into these flies that go into more. So we wanted to see whether these flies gain some protection through this relationship, do they actually have uh, lucibufagens protecting them? Okay. And so we did that same method where we're looking for something that weighs exactly what a lucibufagen weighs. So we ran a standard of the lucibufagen. It came out right at three minutes. This is our winter firefly, right? That, that's where it is in the winter firefly. So what about in this, this uh, parasitic fly? Turns out, it is there, there it is, right? We still have that peak in the parasitic fly. So these parasitic flies are also taking this compound and using it. And we said, well, are they just, is it just coated on the outside because they were digging around through them? Or is it inside them as well? And so we rinsed off and we saw it in the rinse, but we also, after we rinsed them, we looked at what's inside, what was inside them as well. So they really are gaining some protection this way. That's some data showing exactly what the things weigh when you break it apart. Similar, that's all you need. Looks, it looks the same. And so we were able to find that in fact they had these four lucibufagens in there protecting them. So that was a really neat experiment and it shows that these flies steal the chemical. Right? They don't make it themselves, they steal it from, from the firefly. Okay, so 
I'm getting close, you know, you can start, start waking up, if you will, uh, getting close to the end. So um, I told you that I wanted you to leave here, right? with your eyes open and say, wow, the world is a really cool and complex place and I can look into it. And part of what I want to do to show you that is that before I started this work on bugs, I did other stuff at CNN because I didn't have that biology collaborator. So I looked at a plant, okay? I looked at a plant and found that it had this known compound, but this compound, turns out, uh, is an anti-inflammatory compound. So. It, it reduces inflammation, makes people feel better, right, essentially. But no one knew that this plant had it, even though that plant had been used for medicinal purposes in South and Central America. And what I want to point out here is this is really, uh, I thought this was really, really cool, but it was a, a, a situation where I was being very opportunistic. So where did I get this, this medicinal plant? I went to my local hardware store and it was on super discount, right? So it was just on discount at a garden store. And I was like, well, let me Google that plant. Oh, here, here's my phone. Let me Google that plant. Oh, no one's looked at it chemically before. Let's buy them and we'll look at them chemically. And then after the fact, uh, when I found this compound, I realized, well, they're used medicinally and this is why. So I, I got to write on a paper connecting the dots, right? This plant is used medicinally, this compound is medicinal, this is why. Dots connect. Okay? At one point, as, as I told you before, uh, one of my specialties is use of the NMR. Okay? At one point, the NMR instrument at my school broke. Okay? And we were not going to get one for two years. So, because it cost about 500,000 US dollars. So school didn't want to just throw that down really fast. So what was I to do? Well, it turns out that uh, there's a dye, a dye called bromocresol purple, right? And it changes its, its color with pH, but no one knew um, about what the dipole moment of this molecule was. Really obscure thing, right? So a dipole moment is, you know, uh, essentially, would this dissolve better in water or oil, right? Is it polar or non-polar, right? And so I went and I did some, some molecular modeling, right? And I did some experiments with uh, some of the instruments we had left. We had a, a UV vis spectrometer and a fluorimeter, and so I used those. And we were able to get a uh, paper out on that. This is in a completely different field than anything I was ever trained in. It's what's called physical chemistry. And it's very, very math oriented. And luckily, I had a really good undergraduate student who was a math major who helped me out with some of the math because I wouldn't have been able to do it all alone. Right? And so, again, when I say find something that interests you and study it, it doesn't have to be something you, you really know well as long as you can find someone who can do that with you. Right? You can make these collaborations and friendships and you do this stuff. So, what do I want to do in the future? Uh, could I work on more fireflies? I'd love to, right? That would be a lot of fun to do. Um, how about work on some of the Chinese medicine insects? Insects work uh, in Chinese medicine. I'm currently working on that now. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun, but uh, I'm not sure how it's going to translate when I go back, but uh, I'd really like to continue working on some of that. This is a caterpillar I actually saw when I was in Hong Kong once. It's beautiful, right? Um, and it's definitely got some chemical defense. Never, uh, I couldn't find any literature that said anyone has looked at the chemical defense of it yet, but it's beautiful and it must be chemically defended based on the color and the fact it puts droplets out, right? So if anyone here wants to find some of those for me, I'd, I'd love to collaborate in that way. Who knows, maybe I'll work on some fungus again, right? I used to work on fungus. The quite the idea is, I don't know what I'm going to do, right? I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to find something that interests me. I'm going to hopefully get some collaborators who are interested in something, and we're going to find something, and we're going to we're going to make it happen. Okay, so I I am not working on any of these things alone, right? So these are all the collaborators who have worked with me. So uh, Siena College research students, these are all my undergraduates who have worked with me, right? 
there's a lot of them because as an undergraduate, they can't work as long hours as a graduate student, right? So I can't work them 40 hours a week. I get them for about four hours a week. So I need 10 times as many undergraduates as I would need graduate students in order to, to get some papers out. My uh, great biology collaborator, Scott Smedley, um, uh, and he, he actually died about a year and a half ago, so that's why I'm saying who knows what I'm going to be working on in the future, right? Uh, fireflies, at least one of the guys is, is done. Um, my host at Hong Kong Baptist University, who's working on the medicinal bugs with me, Hong Ji Zhang, he is an amazing man, and I was really grateful for him inviting me to stay in Hong Kong. And last of the major talks, <laughs> talking slides, is I want to talk about the Fulbright for just a bit. So this is a scholarship that sent me from the US to Hong Kong. And its purpose is to help mutual understanding between citizens of the US and citizens of other places, in this case, Hong Kong. Uh, and so that means that my goal to fulfill this is to make friendships, collaborations, to teach people what I know, to learn what you know, right? And so uh, I really want to, uh, I've been doing a lot of this experiencing and gaining insights into Hong Kong, especially Dim Sum and, and, and Sai Bang, as I've mentioned before. And so please feel free, I, I'm gonna throw my email address up in a second. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all, whether it's about liberal arts colleges in the US, uh, graduate schools in the US, um, US culture, why you look so funny, whatever the question it is, right? Feel free to, uh, to, to get it to me. Okay, so now that everyone has already put into their phones a map to the nearest exit, we're gonna quickly do our last Kahoot quiz. So just when you thought you were safe and could leave, we're going to do a quiz about what this seminar was about, because as, as we all know, it is really important to do assessments, right? Assessments are very important. That's why you're all filling out forms saying, you know, how much you loved and or hated uh, this talk. So. Again, let's see if Wise Panda shows up. Wise Panda's not gonna be the same person though. I understand how this works, it's okay. Wonder Bee, Fearless Llama, Balanced Horse, Creative Dove, Smiling Giraffe. I, I don't know when those names are gonna get old, but they have not yet. They're really nice. And I didn't tell it to be like biology oriented, oriented at all, because it does that on my process. All right, Glad Penguin, Hero Eagle. Glad Penguin is glad to be waddling out to decisive goat. All right, getting close. We're gonna get to in the 40s. That just opens my email. Other people. Okay, 40. Really, we're gonna just click. That's an unlucky number there. That's a little better, right? I don't want 40. It means I'm gonna die big. All right. What's it about? Where did I grow up? I was not so subtle about this. So, New York, California, Florida. Did he ever grow up? That's an answer. It's a possible answer. It is the green square. You'll see if it's still all the green squares, you know. Okay, what we got? That's good. And... Nice! Okay, well... Uh, that's a pretty... We knew it wasn't California because I do not know how to surf, right? So we knew it wasn't that. Uh, the answer wasn't that Florida or did he ever grow up. They were both acceptable answers. <laughs> Both acceptable answers. All right, proud gecko, keep it going here. Speedy lizard, ooh, it's an all reptile uh, top two. Okay, what types of organisms am I interested in? Plants, insects, fungi, amphibians? What am I interested in? Mm -hmm. There we go, insects. Actually, you'll see they're all correct. I'm interested in all of them. I love all of them. You just, the faster you answer, the more points you got for that one. 
didn't matter what you picked. I am interested in amphibians, actually. The one person who picked that, there's uh, someone at HKBU I'm trying to start a new collaboration with who studies mutes, red-spotted mutes in Hong Kong. Red spotted? Anyway, some sort of mutes in Hong Kong. And we're looking to look at their chemicals. But yes, insects is what I talked about a lot, so that's fine. Okay, next. Oh, speedy lizard proud gecko, they're still up there. A marsupial's trying to claim the next one. Let's see. Okay, what field of study is the best? What's well, just the best? Is it 18th century Chinese history? Is it chemical ecology? Could be corporate risk mitigation, maybe? Or uh, mining big data for public health, you know? Which one's the best? <laughs> same. Chemical ecology, well, that. You knew what I wanted, but they're all the same. There is no best, right? Doesn't matter what you do. I know none of you are chemistry majors, right? Doesn't exist here. So whatever you do, do it, and do it well, and love it. It's great. Thank you, Mining Big Data for Public. I thought that was really good. I came up with that, I was like, you know, that's, that's, that's good. A lot of people will pick that, he said, incorrectly. Smiling giraffe, oh, speedy lizard. Oh, proud gecko, you're way back now. Just, Okay, how would you contact me if you have any questions? You talk to me in person, maybe? I don't know, maybe that's the answer. You can email, here's my email address, right? Here's my email address. You, you could ask someone who knows my email address, right? You could ask someone, or you could Google it, right? Any of those? There we go. Yeah, 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 they're all right again. They're all right. I, I felt so guilty about switching up the green square as the last question, right, in the earlier quiz. I'm like, oh, let's make them all right. Okay. So uh, there we go, decisive goat. And then when you tell people about this talk, you will describe it as too long. I think that's likely considering I'm 14 minutes over my time, right? Feel free. Boring, interesting, fun. Hunger-inducing isn't on there, but possible. Nice! Okay, see, that's my form of assessment. I like that. Uh, props to the people who are honest, you know? It's, it's anonymous, so you could have all been honest, but, you know, those nine people have integrity, so that's good. All right. So, decisive goat wins only one reptile on the podium. Boy, ooh, that was a, that was a terrible one. Okay, so... With that, that was our last last thing, and I do want to thank you all for your kind attention. I know I went long. I was just bragging about how I had a 45 time minute window, and there's no way I'm going to miss on that, and I went over by 15 minutes. So I really appreciate you all staying through the end, and um, really, really, if you have any questions, um, you can either talk to me in person after or email me. Okay. Well, first, uh Help me thank uh, Steve for the talk. Are there any questions? Should I start? I always have to start. Right? Yeah. So, so I have a question. So you said for your, your postdoc you used 50,000, and then the next project 500, and then you're able to go to an individual war and just that drop of, of liquid. Is that something that is due to the technolo technological advances, or what was, what was the cause in this? Okay, so, uh, so uh, awesome, thank you. So uh, you, you sort of caught me in a little bit of an exaggeration. So part of it was that the 50,000 beetles were much, much smaller. So I needed a lot more of them. Um, in mass, I probably only cut it in half when I went to the fireflies. Um, in the, the advance that I had there uh, was primarily that I was looking at compounds that were similar to things that we know. And so it was easier to find the data without um, needing... Uh, um, <laughs> you knew what you for. Yeah, I knew what I was looking for, so it was, it was much easier to find it than, than with the beetles. So I could use probably half the mass. However, uh, when I went from the uh, 500 to 1, okay, that was in part an instrument upgrade. So uh, we had a better instrument at that time, and um, the other advantage with that was 
Uh, all I was looking for is yes, no, do I have signals? I didn't have to figure out what the molecule was because we knew what it was. And then when I went to the blood droplets, what that was was switching to a more sensitive instrument. So we went from the NMR to the mass spec. And the mass spec is like a thousand times more sensitive. But it gives you less information. It only tells you how much something weighs. So uh, I traded in some, some chemical information for some sensitivity. But, but yeah, 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 you caught me in sort of an exaggeration. There. <laughs> there's a sim because there's a similar advance in biology where before we're looking at some DNA, we have to have tons of DNA, and now you can look at a single DNA molecule and find out the sequence of that single one, which I think I thought was a very comparable to what you Absolutely, yeah. We, uh, our instruments haven't progressed quite as much as PCR techniques and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'm glad I don't have to use anything quite that sensitive because I know it would always be like, this DNA is from a human male, right? Like that's all the DNA. You have another chance. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I'm not sure if it's related, but I'm curious, like, does human also uh, somehow release some chemical substances, for example, like phenols? And also, I'm, I'm curious, like, when we eat some insects, do we somehow acquire that chemical kind of substances to us? Yes. Okay, so on the question of pheromones, human pheromones, people have been trying to find the right ones for a long time, and there are cosmetic companies that claim they have found them. And then they have the magic spray that you can spray spray it on and get, get the uh, partner of your dreams from that. Uh, however, there's a large debate still going on. I would think um, that probably yes. The problem is we're not really very well equipped to find it because pheromones generally are produced in incredibly small amounts. So the first pheromone that was ever uh, identified in, uh, uh, from a natural source was actually from silk moths, uh, the silk moth pheromone, and it needed ridiculous amounts. Like I talked about my 50,000 beetles, but they were, they were talking about using, you know, essentially giant truckloads of, you know, silkworms to get enough of these, these pheromones. Um, and luckily they had them do the silk industry. <laughs> uh, so uh, unfortunately, we're not allowed to grind up, uh, I should say fortunately, we're not allowed to grind up hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people to get at the pheromones. So it would be a very different, there would also be other ethical questions about whether it's okay to spray people with something that may make them more attractive. Um, human sequestration. Um, I don't know about the insects, um, but I do know that there are certain molecules that when you take it in, you actually sweat out, right? So. Uh, people who eat a lot of garlic, sometimes you can tell, not just from their breath, but you can sometimes smell it in the, in the sweat. Uh, there are some other compounds like that. I think curcumin is like that. There are some of the compounds in cumin are like that too. So. More questions? More questions? What, uh, what was the beetle that you, like the caterpillar that you showed us? Like, was oh. it, uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll still look for it already. Oh, that's fantastic. That would be awesome. And if you can figure out what plant it's eating, too, and then we'll get out of the plant, too, that would be awesome. So uh, I looked it up. Uh, luckily, uh, the internet is, is abundant with resources. It's called Drury's Jewel. It's D R U R Y, apostrophe S, Drury's, some guy named Drury, which is not an easy word to say, Drury. Uh, and then Jewel, J-E-W-E-L. So it's Drury's Jewel, and uh, not Jewel, Jewel. Well, it's hard to say. Um, and yeah, I couldn't, I mean, we would have to do another, you know, search, literature search, make sure no one's done it because it seems so obvious. But that's one of the things that, uh, there are things out there that are really obviously seeming that people haven't done. And I, I last looked that up two years ago. And as of two years ago, I could find nothing that people have done. And it would be really interesting to see what plants eat, whether the plants have something, whether the caterpillars get it from the plants, what the caterpillars have, and so on and so forth. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, you can go. Go get something to eat. It's 722.
All right, so one last time, help, help me uh, thank, thanks.